This content may not be suitable for all ages. Listener discretion is advised. I was trying to pee and all of a sudden, I felt all my hair raise. I know someone was watching me. And then I saw Guts running towards me and I just got up to move towards you. A loose copse of birch, a willow, and a massive pine tree was all that could shield us from the imminent beating now. I spoke up and asked him if he was taking a different route. He pretended not to understand me, but kept staring at us and smirking in the rear view. From Disturbed Media, join your host, Chad, for true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, and unexplainable events. This is Disturbed. Thanks to Canva Pro for supporting Disturbed. Canva Pro is an easy-to-use design platform that has everything you need to start designing like a pro. Get a free 45-day extended trial by going to canva.me slash disturbed. Welcome back in, everyone, and thanks for joining me. Well, we're rolling right on through the summer months. And as a reminder, you can share your experience for a chance to be on the show. Email my story at disturbedpodcast.com. Or if you want your voice heard on the show, I recommend recording a voice clip on your device and attaching it to your email. Let's keep those creepy stories coming. We open the show hearing from Reddit user Rep143, and we learn all about the deep, dark woods. Bringing this experience to life is Tom Aglio. I posted this in Missing 411, and in my planning of my upcoming camping trips, felt the urge to post it here. Mostly a copy and paste with an update on one of the family members. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently stumbling on this sub, I finally felt a place I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon, and felt comfortable in the woods and have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. I have included the coordinates of our campsite, which we found to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy since they are intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It was not an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off a USFS road that had flat ground full trees and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from me and my wife's tent. We made the male German shepherd sleep, Guts is his name, with her in the tent. That whole first night, neither my wife and I could sleep. We both heard footsteps and they were heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from reading recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection, and that is why I felt my daughter could sleep alone, because Guts is completely fearless, and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided was deer or maybe some elk. Day 2. Morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away see the circle area in the photo. I see an abandoned road where a rusted gate post, gate was missing, was covered in vegetation. Something of blue color caught my eye and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race because I think it's another family camping like us and he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can and the rest follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road and me yelling his name, but I have covered just enough distance to see that there is nobody there and something is off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the site conditions were. As I get closer, I know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, but every single item 
had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles puzzled why anyone would leave all their camping gear behind, including an expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and animals got to the rest as the only logical explanation. Still, a propane tank and the cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, me and my daughter are playing bocce ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I do not have direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight towards her. Normally he would always be with me unless he's called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another 100 feet before I call him and he stopped. My other dog Leah, who never misses an opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front bossing everything in her path and pauses to look to see where we are and continues. I asked my wife what happened, and she said I was trying to pee and all of a sudden, I felt all my hair raise, I know someone was watching me. And then I saw Guts running towards me and I just got up to move towards you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something went. We decide we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we will all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing I have done with a rope that was so old and brown, I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, 8 to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt someone has stayed here before and put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree I am maybe 10 to 15 years ago, based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure the girls felt we are safe, and at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came around, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we are armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that now knows we have two wolves and are armed and we are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped, and we all thank our lucky star as Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. Update from original posting, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he saved us. He was a warrior and his new brother Geronimo has his spirit. Want to listen to Disturbed ad-free? Of course you do. Go to disturbedpodcast.com slash support to get your access today. Next up is our title story coming to us from Reddit user Baby Legumes Revenge. And we learn to beware of the birthday mob. Bringing this experience to life is Matt Bradford. I've had a couple of frightening occurrences throughout my life, but none that have ever rivaled the distressing nature of one particular night during my senior year of high school. You see, 
I had been coping through the latest in a series of breakups with my girlfriend and was searching for any reason I could find to leave my angst dungeon of a home office where I already spent countless hours dwelling on the end of the relationship. My friend, Mia, resided in a neighboring subdivision and had invited me down to hang with herself and her brother. Since I'd only been acquainted with Mia for a short while, my social anxiety urged me to forward the invitation along to another friend and frequent companion of mine, Robert. Mia had no trouble with this, and Robert seldom, if ever, required advance notice for casual misadventures, allowing for his presence to be a guarantee well before asking him. Mia had conditions of her own, insisting that I called a meter as soon as we arrived at the transit station in her area. I had been to Mia's house once on an evening not long before where I shared in a politely tense dinner interrogation with her folks, and it was a fairly straightforward route from where the bus would let us off. The gesture never registered as anything more than a courtesy, and so I agreed unquestionably, just feeling fortunate for the company. Robert had amassed a small cache of fireworks that he'd been looking to set off at an appropriate time. Since that time never arose, I let him know that tonight was the night, as I waited on him at the back porch by his bedroom. He muttered in protest, then immediately relented and snatched indiscriminately from the stockpile underneath his bed. In 20 minutes, a city bus took us through familiar haunts, eventually crossing over the bus trap that existed as an informal boundary between two communities on the northwest side of town. Well, it was a tightly constructed underpass accessible only to public transport and compact commercial trucks, with a walkway protected by concrete dividers for bikes and pedestrian foot traffic. The central feature, and origin of its name, is a square pit with a loose arrangement of steel bars meant to ensnare intruding vehicles that didn't meet the specific requirements to enter. Now, this was before the dawn of the sports utility vehicle would render them obsolete and an automated gate was installed to continue justifying its function. Now, a bit of an anomaly in its current environment, it still served its purpose and was akin to an unguarded border checkpoint. I hadn't anticipated going out that night, so when we made it to the station close to 11, I was consciously conserving my limited cell life to let Mia know of our arrival. The low battery icon flashed after the call an indication that there was plenty enough left over to punish myself with a prospect of a reconciliatory message from my ex that would appear through the virtue of wishful thinking. As Robert and I warbled through a catalog of 80s tunes at vacillating pitches, a beat behind tempo, a black SUV with tinted windows blew past us in the parking area next to the station. Its tires whirred banshee-like against the asphalt as it weaved erratically. The unseen driver beating out a rallying cry on the horn before tearing off toward the same inner ring suburb that we were destined for ourselves. And me and her brother arrived not long after, and we set our sights on a nearby schoolyard to cause a racket with some consumer grade fireworks. In a fleeting spectacle, the twin Roman candles and a majority of the bottle rockets had been expended with all but a few duds in the array, fulfilling their advertised purpose of attracting attention. Another roving SUV came streaking down the road closest to the schoolyard within minutes. A collection of balloons tethered to the interior of the vehicle through a gap in the rear window battled the wind's thrust before the vehicle came to a jarring halt. Mia abruptly directed us to wait where we were and jogged off in the direction of the idling SUV. We witnessed a figure hop out of the passenger seat to approach her, and though they were out of earshot, I felt a deep ease of relief as she received the greeting with warmth. There was a rapport and friendliness not commonly associated with the foreboding strangers that you meet after dark. Mia was the type of person that you couldn't help but like. You know, she was bright, amiable, talented, and never did much to offend anyone. You know, she treated everyone on equal terms and her resulting popularity eclipsed the alleged social strata of senior high school. I, on the other hand, was far more familiar with certain classroom archetypes that I ever would have liked to have been. The chocks, the bullies, the bad seats, many of whom converged on a fixed point of our hometown's map, the apparent center of which was her former district school. In spite of its academic reputation, the student body had attained some degree of notoriety for its high rate of juvenile offenders. I was reasonably confident at this age that the flaring tempers between the respective cliques would simmer off after graduation, but there would always be those select few that would make illicit behavior and more premeditated acts of physical violence a lifestyle choice. I was, and am to this day, a tiny man at 30 years old, 
never rising above 5 feet 4 inches, and what you might conceive of as an easy target. And the reputation I held in my own halls was one of a mischievous but good-natured slacker who could take a punch but couldn't throw one, and I relied on the more beneficial trait to compensate for my deficit of muscle mass when diffusing tense situations with somebody outside my chosen circle of oddballs. It didn't have a foolproof rate of success, but it allowed me to skate by relatively unscathed for most of my scholastic career. Mia and the stranger exchanged a quick embrace before their parting waves. I watched the SUV as it pulled a hasty U-turn, careening past a stop sign to startle unwary pedestrians with its engine elsewhere away from us. Unprompted, but desired nonetheless, we were provided with some critical context that was about to color the remainder of the night as soon as she reconvened with her group. Now, that was a friend of mine from St. Francis. They're out celebrating his buddy's 18th birthday by driving around and beating the shit out of people walking by themselves. Now, you're fine with me here, but I think we should probably head inside now. In the moments that followed, I took notice of how the lights emanating from the surrounding homes in the area had grown increasingly scarce, the parceled rations of security that they represented winking out of existence along with them. Fine by me, then. I mean, I'd rather not be the elected guest sacrifice in some kid's twisted adulthood initiation rites as he proves his machismo to his buddies while they trade turns packing my face in. And when we got to Mia's house shortly thereafter, without any incident, the mood had grown contemplatively quiet as we settled in, having had a light-hearted evening of adolescent merrymaking spoiled by douchebags. Everyone was worn out, so we agreed to toss on a film, some inoffensive mid-aughts comedy that I can't recall the name of. Not even 20 minutes had passed in the runtime before Mia's father appeared at the living room threshold. Mia, it's getting late. Say goodnight to your friends. There's been a lot of speculation whenever I've recounted this story over who was primarily at fault for the avoidable events that transpired afterward. And though I've heard out accusations that I've been overly forgiving, I remain of the mind that everyone was honestly intended. I mean, Mia had spoken in our favor citing the potentially dangerous circumstances that awaited us outside. Her father met these claims with a liberal dose of parental skepticism, while Robert and I advocated for our own well-being by sitting in abject silence as the scene unfolded. And despite the mild to moderate unrest from earlier, the sedating calm of lounging indoors on a sofa had a minimizing effect on the risks involved. I mean, taking into consideration how many dozens of streets this community was comprised of, if we moved quickly and took precautions, what was the likelihood that those goons would ever catch a second glimpse of us? He dismissed it as an exaggeration. She had made her best effort to explain our situation and dissuade her father from booting us to the curb, but as an honor student with devoutly invested parents, the rules of the household are inviolable. Bed by twelve and no sanctuary for teenage boys overnight. There was no argument to convince him otherwise. As we were standing on Mia's front porch, she belatedly informed us that there was not one or two, but a total of four SUVs out on the prowl. After offering us her profuse apologies and well wishes, we reassured her that we'd be fine. She then latched the door behind us so we could set to recalculating our odds. My cellular battery had long since been drained having waited for that text like the lovelorn sap that I was. And Robert, on the other hand, had never been bothered to carry a cell phone with him as he communicated with everyone he knew almost exclusively over MSN Messenger. Ill prepared for the occasion. It looked as if we were resigned to traveling by foot. We paced about the cul-de-sac considering which routes would keep us from straying onto the main streets and arterial roads. Now, the most sensible was also the longest, with the bus trap being a clean getaway from the birthday boy and his pals. And we were fortunate to have gone to school in the area, and we knew of the many tucked away corridors and shortcuts where ample tree canopies would be able to conceal us in the shadows. I mean, we could stay virtually hidden for 80% of the journey if we used our wits. It's worth reiterating here again that we were remedial teenagers for whom flexing poor judgment skills was a respected tradition. We were also aware that the transit station would be shuttering relatively soon, and while the train wouldn't be of any use to us since this particular station was the final terminal on the line, there was just a sliver of chance that the buses might still be active. It was only a short walk back the way we came through a park overlooking the entrance. 
And from there on, we'd be completely exposed with nothing but looming storefronts and a large barren parking lot illuminated by what might as well have been the halogen floodlights they shine on escaped prisoners as they rush across the yard toward freedom. We chose to hazard our bet since it was practically on our way to the bus stop anyhow. Taking inventory of what could prove useful to us, I wasn't at all surprised to find my pockets empty, save for a wallet and the dead cell phone. Robert held a Zippo lighter in his possession as well as a single remaining bottle rocket. Needled by a desire to feel resourceful, I scanned our surroundings before spotting a remodeled home with an industrial disposal bin out in the front street. I leapt inside and re-emerged with a wooden plank fanged with crooked finishing nails that I hefted in my hand like a Buford Pusser reborn. This failed to impose any profound dread, but I did win a derisive laugh from Robert. He gestured to me with his bottle rocket, expressing his desire to fire it into someone's face should they try and come near us. Now heavily armed and in much higher spirits, we skulked around the interposing footpaths between neighborhoods, which, in hindsight, did little to help us steady our nerves. Our courage, however, faltered at an intersection where a lone, dusty street lamp stood sentinel by a vestibule of low-slung branches, so compact it was as if someone draped a shroud across the moon. I mean, lifelong urbanites get to relish in the light pollution that paints our skyline, mistaken in the belief that even proper darkness has a translucent quality. And then, here was this one stretch of pavement so innocuous by day, restyled after sunset as a disorienting tunnel with a stark density of exhaust fumes. We crept in, a maximum of 25 to 30 feet ahead, before paralysis struck. The night's deserted ambiance punctuated by the remote echoes of shouting, squealing tires and the sudden acceleration of a vehicle. Only able to locate each other by our voices suspended in limbo, we agonized in whispers as to how we should proceed. I mean, do we find an alternate detour or stick it out, listening for any further suggestion of movement on the other side of the emptiness? Beset with paranoia, the eerie silence returned was a potent incentive to turn around. We briefly contemplated camping out for the remainder of the night before opting to double back. We subsequently found our way through the park exit to the main thoroughfare. There was little in the way of traffic at night, so if one of the SUVs were to materialize, we would see them plainly. And they would see us. We strained our hearing for any trace of obnoxious motor revving before bolting across the road and past the parking lot to the nearest transit base. We hurriedly checked the posted bus times, but each had made their final loop ages ago, a station clock revealing what our hesitation had cost us. Diminished and resolved, we aimed to take shelter in the train terminal which was typically left unlocked after hours. And if we were able to be granted any small mercies, the, the universe wasn't ready to let us cash in yet, and the locked station doors rattled in their frames as they refused to budge. Our choice determined for us, we moved on to the bus trap. Every distant noise provided a reason to flinch, never certain if it was a thrill-seeking motorist out for a joyride or the assailants that were preoccupying our thoughts. There was a strong possibility that someone had called the police on them or that they had driven off to avoid detection. I mean, in a cosmically just world, they'd have already been under arrest without their faithfully appointed rendezvous with a sorry individual who had the audacity to pick that night of all nights to take in the early autumn breeze. Maybe they had even grown bored with their party plans altogether. We started to let our guards slip as we neared our old junior high school, believing that the worst case scenario we were on the alert for was already behind us, and I was still lofting around a cumbersome piece of wood like a full-fledged jackass. It was a welcome lull, but the effects of fatigue began to wear on me as the initial surge of adrenaline tapered off. Another network of loosely interconnected passages awaited us at the far end of the school. Backyard passes exhibiting the scribbled handiwork of amateur graffiti artists beckoned our entry. Our off-property lunch breaks had taken us that way years beforehand, so we knew for a fact it had intermitting street lamps every 60 feet or so. And whether they were even operational was a different matter. But as it turned out, this was a low priority for the community. To my knowledge, they still haven't been replaced a decade later. Motion-sensing porch lights would flutter field of view at blinding intervals. Robert, all the while sparking a Zippo out of fitful habit to disclose his growing impatience with our inching progress. Twigs snapping beneath the paws of nocturnal animals out on a midnight forge aroused silhouetted figures from my overworked imagination, ones that reached out with invisible hands to seize their quarry and pummel us bloody. 
finally, a steady source of light appeared ahead, and we came out onto the street with that holiest of landmarks now within sprinting distance, though neither of us was feeling so athletically inclined. Cutting through an elementary school, our humor gradually returned to us, having turned a leisurely stroll into some clumsy trial of stealth. And compared to the winding trip we had taken to get here, full of retraced steps, dead-end deviations, and hesitant plodding through neglected footpaths, this last leg had been lit up like a runway welcoming us home. We slid back into our ordinary banter with safety on the horizon again. I openly considered how long I would hold on to my improvised bludgeon before I discarded it in some baffling manner that a homeowner would try in vain to puzzle together at sunrise. But as I took listless swings with the plank in my forward gait, a black SUV came peeling out from around the corner on the left-hand side of the bus trap. The, the balloons hung from the rearview window flailed backwards from the velocity as the engine roared. Had they been waiting for somebody this entire fucking time? didn't really matter at this stage. There's no way they hadn't seen us. I cursed repeatedly as we dashed a half a block in retreat, turning off onto the street adjacent to the elementary school. We had to think fast as the rapid advance only left us with a rough 15 second lead even at the posted speed limit, and they had no intention of giving us any advantages. The front yards melded together, lacking any distinction between property lines, leaving us nowhere to crouch and hide. We could hear the vehicle gaining ground on us. Our heads started all but evaporated, and I raised a panicked finger toward the only space that could pass for cover, a partial strip of flimsy side yard fencing. No accompanying front fence, no perimeter hedges, nothing. I mean, ashamedly, I entertained the impulse of launching myself over the fence, knowing full well it would leave Robert behind. I sprawled myself onto the grass, hugging close to the fence with Robert following suit. Long like boards and stiff as corpses our respective implements at the ready, looking all the more laughably desperate than ever before. A loose copse of birch, a willow, and a massive pine tree was all that could shield us from the imminent beating now. The SUV lost speed as it made the turn, the headlights shine intensifying as they drew near. We may have unwittingly bought ourselves the element of surprise, but without a clue as to how we'd properly exploit it, Robert uncapped the Zippo and nestled it close to the fuse, his thumbs on the flint wheel. I attempted to press myself further into the ground, but the hard earth wouldn't give away. They came to a full stop and parked at the edge of the property, right fucking next to us. A sleek chrome grill peered out from beyond the fence line. The doors popped open as the birthday mob murmured indiscernibly and began pacing as they searched for us. I tried to gather a sense of the disparity in numbers by tracking their footfalls. My ear wasn't up to the task, but it was enough to know that the ratio was firmly set against us, and we'd be surrounded if we decided to flee. I had seldom, if ever, swung a fist at anyone, always too busy with the illusion of composure to defend myself at the risk of looking foolish for it. At least then, being on a first-name basis with my rogues gallery of aloof tormentors was humanizing enough that a scuffle wouldn't escalate to injure anything but my pride. And these people were strangers. And they weren't aware of the bullshit persona that I affected, my ragdoll antics where I would swallow pain with a wry smirk. They, they didn't know I pretended to treat it as a game. All they wanted was to hurt us. So, this was it. This was where I'd be forced to shed the layer of protective cowardice and earn my own fucking respect. I gripped the plank tightly. Tiny splinters burrowed in my palm as I caught the sound of my thrumming heart rate. This helped summon my 125 pounds of buried aggression from years of play-acting my way through confrontation to outmatch the fear of a losing fight. My free hand fumbled on the nails as I pried them upright. I prayed that Robert's fireworks would generate a significant amount of confusion so that I would get a few good cracks during the ambush before they'd have us back on the ground and ready for our ambulance ride. I mean, even if I was only going to get in one strike, I was going to make sure it connected. But then, everything fell into a drawn-out stillness, with only the galvanic hum of the nearest street lamp to add its supporting harmony. An unfocused peace overtook my focused reveries of meeting out a solitary blow of disfiguring bloodshed when I heard a frustrated voice lowly utter the phrase, ah, fuck it. Slamming doors followed in the wake of this statement. The SUV sprung to life, the wheels skidding as they pulled out and sped off. Just like that, they were gone. 
the rigor of our bodies softened as we collapsed in place, not yet ready to sit up for the fear that this might be a tactic. The longer we stayed, the clearer it became that we had been gifted the Deus Ex Machina we spent the night waiting for. When we had regained our bearings and were ready to push ourselves up, we drifted along the side streets in relative quiet. We never wandered away from the center of the road. I haven't come up with a satisfying explanation as to what kept us from skulking the remainder of the way back to the bus trap. It just didn't seem necessary any longer. I suppose you can chalk it up to a symptom of trauma's insulating afterglow. Though, if you were to ask us then, we wouldn't have been able to process the shock and admit such a thing. It would live on as another treasured anecdote until the day that we could afford psychologists to tell us otherwise. We had almost forgotten to acknowledge the fact that we made it. From within our collective fugue, we glanced back down the road looking for some significance to the whole ordeal, I mean, because it felt like the type of thing a person ought to do. But if there was any poignant denouement waiting for us at the end, it wasn't readily apparent from the other side of the underpass. If I had to shoehorn in a takeaway, it's that despite my aversion to conflict and my previous assumptions about my yellow instincts, if miserable happenstance finds me backed into the corner again, I might just be able to stand my ground. I just sure as hell hope that there's some discarded timber nearby when that time comes. We need to get rid of some evidence. Don't go anywhere. When Disturbed first launched back in May 2020, I really had no idea how to go about creating eye-catching graphics for each episode, and I really needed something that would be easy for someone who is not a designer by any means. Then I found Canva Pro, a super easy to use design platform that has everything you need to design like a pro. You'll have access to a collection of over 75 million premium photos, videos, audios, and graphics that you can use for just about any project or idea. Not only that, but Canva Pro gives you the time-saving tools that help speed up that creative process. No matter your skill level, Canva Pro gives you everything you need to boost your productivity and creativity. Now on my end, I needed a service that would allow me to create great visuals for each episode of Disturbed. And I gotta say, my knowledge and skill level on how to do this was not so good. I didn't feel like I had a bunch of free time to go and learn how to design graphics by watching tons of YouTube videos. But with Canva Pro, none of that is a problem because they make everything super simple and user-friendly. And I promise if I can do it, anyone can. My favorite part of using Canva Pro is accessing that giant library of high-quality images that I can use to help create the episode thumbnails for Disturbed. You just search for an image or an idea, scroll through the results, and drag it onto your canvas. Then I just add in some nice text and I'm done. It's that easy. And if you want a real-time visual, go check out our website, disturbedpodcast.com. All of the episode artwork was created using Canva Pro. But there's so many other reasons to use Canva. Logos, brands, social media graphics, business cards, banners, marketing material, almost anything you can think of that you need to create, you can do it on Canva Pro. So the best thing you can do is go see for yourself exactly what Canva Pro can do for you. Right now, listeners of Disturbed have access to this special offer. Get a free 45-day extended trial by going to canva.me slash disturbed. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash disturbed to get your free 45-day extended trial. And we thank Canva Pro for their support of Disturbed. Now back to the horror. And finally we have an online submission from Allison. And we learn about the fear of being at someone else's mercy. Bringing this experience to life is Sarah Thomas. In 2005, I decided to take a last minute trip to Punta Cana with my friend for a few days after a messy breakup with my boyfriend. Our hotel was gorgeous. The beaches were perfect and the food was excellent. After a few days there, we realized we were running out of their currency and cash 
and wouldn't have enough to tip hotel workers or to make local purchases on the beach or at the markets. The hotel required their currency, no U.S. money to be used, so we needed to find money. I went to the hotel service desk, asked how I could exchange currency. They suggested calling a cab to take us to a local bank to get money, as they did not exchange at the hotel. Since the hotel was obviously reputable, we trusted that they would call us a cab company that would get us there and back safely. The cab ride was 20 US dollars each way. They said they'd take US money, so we never thought twice. The hotel called the cab for us. A beaten up maroon minivan pulled up out front and said he was there to get us about 10 minutes later. Normally, I would never get in a crappy minivan with a random smelly man to take me to a foreign bank, but we weren't in New York City, so it seemed reasonable and we didn't have any other choice. The driver didn't seem to speak much English, but understood that we needed to get to a bank and we needed a ride back to the same hotel. While driving through dirt roads and past poverty-stricken neighborhoods and staring out the window in complete and utter shock seeing how they lived there, we caught the driver creepily staring at us multiple times in his rearview mirror. Although uncomfortable, I never felt in danger at that time. We tried to strike up a conversation a few times to ease the tension, but he didn't speak English. So we sat there for what seemed like forever in this stinky minivan on our way to the bank. We finally arrived at the bank, and when we got there, he gestured that he would wait five minutes for us. We went in, exchanged 400 US dollars for, I can't remember how much in currency, and went back out to jump in this creeps minivan. We just wanted to get back to our hotel. We still had plenty of US currency on us. The bank would only exchange up to $400 US at a time. After a few minutes, I realized he seemed to be taking a different way back to the hotel than we had come. I spoke up and asked him if he was taking a different route. He pretended not to understand me, but kept staring at us and smirking in the rear view. It was starting to feel like something was up. So my friend and I started exchanging looks, like we were prepared to fight this guy if it came down to it. I kept looking at him, around him to see if he had any weapons, to assess what kind of danger we might be in. I didn't see anything, but the tension was incredibly intense. After 20 minutes, we definitely weren't back at our hotel. We pulled up to a semi-paved area I didn't recognize under some thick trees in what seemed like a very remote area. No one was around. We had no idea where we were. All we saw were trees, no hotels, nothing. My friend and I looked at each other like we were going to kill this motherfucker if he tried anything. She's a big girl and I was much smaller, but I've had no problem arguing with 1,000 pound horses all my life. So it occurred to me that the two of us could manage this guy if he tried anything. He abruptly stopped the van by stomping on the brakes and we flew forward. We heard the doors lock all at once. I think before the vehicle was even fully stopped. I went to grab the handle to slide the door open. It seemed to be an automatic response to the sound of the locks. I looked back at him and my super bitch kicked in. So I screamed at him, what the fuck are you doing? He turned around and in perfect English and with the most sinister stare from the scariest eyes I've ever seen said, you give me $200 US for the ride or you're not going back to your hotel. And then he grinned like he knew he had us. And I do believe he meant what he said. I looked at my friend. She stared back. We didn't know what to do. There was a momentary decision. Escalate this and take a chance of this ending badly or give him the money and hope we can get back safely. I said, so if I give you all the money I have, you will take us back now? We decided to give him the money. We actually had more, but thankfully had thought to split it up in case one of us lost some. He took it, didn't say another word, put the van in drive, and took us back. When we arrived at the hotel, he kept the doors locked and demanded $80 for the $40 cab ride that had already cost us $200. We gave it to him, got out, 
and ran into the hotel. We reported it to the front desk immediately, but not only did they not care, they basically accused us of lying. Needless to say, after that experience, I'll never put myself in a situation like that again. It was careless and stupid and could have ended very badly. But I feel like we made the right decision because we were in a third world country with no knowledge of where we were with a creep who could have done anything to us and no one would have even noticed we were missing for days. Lessons learned? Bring enough currency and don't take cab rides from creeps in maroon minivans in Punta Cana. Follow our social channels on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod. Thanks to everyone for continuing to send in your stories via email at mystory at disturbedpodcast.com over the hotline at 701-354-3667 or the online submission form at disturbedpodcast.com slash submit. Disturbed is an independent production funded through advertising and listener support. Thanks to those who share the show with friends and leave positive reviews. These things help new listeners find us. Follow or subscribe wherever you're listening right now so you never miss an episode. And if you'd like to hear these episodes without the ads, you can get early access to our premium ad-free feed as well as monthly bonus episodes. Visit disturbedpodcast.com slash support to learn more. And a shout out to all of our newest supporters, Cassandra Levine, Anthony and Tony Rockafinch, Summer Spatz, Kanisha Hampton, and Lexi Townsend. Thanks so much for supporting the show. Music by Carl Casey at White Bat Audio and Co.ag. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all. <laughs>